Father, as we draw near to you and open up your word, we pray that your spirit would do his work of opening our minds and our hearts to your truth, that by, in Jesus' name you would banish Satan and his forces from this place, and that we would be free to focus on your word and to take seriously your calling to be faithful soldiers in your army. God, go with us, bless us as we hear this word and apply it to our lives and our calling to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, and we're going to look this morning at the first 13 verses of that chapter as we continue our fall series on Blessed to be a Blessing. And we look today at the theme of God's call to his soldiers on this Veterans Day. And that text is found on page 1853 in your Bibles. <clears throat> Apostle Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, You then, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Well, dear family and the faith, today, as I've said a couple of times, is the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day. When on November 11, 1918, at 11 o'clock, an armistice was signed between the Allies and Germany to end fighting on the Western Front at the close of World War II. Here in America, today is also Veterans Day. On this Veterans Day, when we honor our men and women who have served in the military, I remember a particular moment during my candidacy interview nearly 11 years ago now, when I was first reminded clearly of your value of honoring our military. The date was December 2, 2007. Seems like a long time ago now. This is the first time I had preached at 12th Avenue Christian Reformed Church. I remember preaching on our wonderful counselor from uh, John 15, 25, and 26, and I remember singing a song, Emmanuel, uh, during the worship service, and remember uh, after the worship service, sitting up front here with Sherry, my wife, and, and you had the opportunity to, to ask questions. It was a town hall meeting, and Merle, I think you were emceeing uh, that meeting uh, th at that time. And we had a, the privilege of answering several questions from you, and I remember one question went something like this. Uh, do you support our military? And I remember, as I sought to answer that question, getting kind of choked up. And I'm, and I'm not sure fully why that was. Maybe that was partly because of 
the emotional roller coaster of being a candidate and, and having a lot of emotions going through me, but I think also part of it was a feeling of compassion for your loved ones who were in harm's way, especially in this post-9-11 world in which we live. And I remember just having a real sense of how important it is in this church family here of ours that we honor our men and women in uniform. Well, during my ministry here, I've made it a, a weekly practice, as you know, to pray for our military every Sunday and to pray for the specific needs of your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters as they've been deployed or as they've had particular needs. We made it a weekly practice to list your loved ones in the military in our bulletin. And I've also enjoyed recognizing our veterans on Veterans Day and take very seriously the pain of military families who have lost loved ones as we commemorate Memorial Day. I've been blessed to develop close friendships with several veterans here in the congregation. And I love to hear your military stories and looking forward to sharing just a few of them here this morning as we reflect together. As we continue reflecting this morning on the theme of blessed to be a blessing, we continue to focus on it as it unfolds in both the Old and the New Testaments. We've seen how this theme plays out with Abraham, with Joseph, the Hebrews after the Exodus, the Israelites as they were about to enter the Promised Land, Daniel, and the Jews after the exile. We've seen this theme in Jesus' teaching about his followers being salt and light in the world. Last time we looked at this theme as it was presented in the Apostle Paul's letters in Galatians, first of all, as we are called as Gentiles to exercise our faith as recipients of Abraham's blessing. Today we look at that theme in Paul's second and final letter, to Timothy. Paul emphasizes to his spiritual son that we are blessed as soldiers of Christ to be a blessing in our faithful duty. The first thing that Paul shares with his son Timothy and to us is that we are blessed as soldiers of Christ to be strong and faithful in suffering. Paul writes to his spiritual son, Timothy, who serves as the leader of the church in Ephesus. It's either the year A.D. 66 or 67. Paul's been arrested a second time by the Roman authorities after ministering for about four years after his house arrest and his release from that. Paul's now in the Mamertine prison, and he is now under a death sentence by Emperor Nero. This epistle could be considered Paul's last will and testament to his son in the faith. Paul shares his final advice to his mentee, Timothy, the spiritual leader of the next generation, the spiritual leader. Paul begins the second chapter of his letter with some exhortations to Timothy in the face of hostile imperial authorities on the outside of the church and also with false teachers on the inside of the church. Paul says in verses 1 to 3, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. First, Paul calls Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul urges Timothy to be strengthened by the grace of Jesus Christ in an intimate relationship with him. Second, Paul urges Timothy to entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, Paul wants Timothy to pass the content of Paul's preaching and teaching, the good news of Jesus Christ, to 
trustworthy, dependable people who in turn will teach that good news and those Christian doctrines to others. Timothy had accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys, and he had heard his teaching repeatedly in the synagogues and in the marketplaces and in the house churches and other places. Paul, no doubt, had shared these vital doctrines with Timothy one-on-one -on -one as part of his mentoring and training. Well, our church was involved with Calvin Seminary's Renewal Lab. One of the teaching pastors, Scott Vanderplug, who happens to be the grandson of one of our deceased members, Elaine Vanderplug, shared with us his discipleship model that he uses at his church in Florida. And as a person is discipled one-on-one, -on -one, that person is responsible to, to share that teaching that, that Scott has shared with somebody else who would benefit from it. Scott's simply continuing in the 21st century what Paul and the other apostles and their fellow workers did back in the first century. Third, Paul invites Timothy to endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Well, Paul is in prison for his faith and missionary work, and Timothy is not at this point. Paul encourages his spiritual son to join him and other Christ followers willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for their commander-in-chief as a soldier of Christ. Soldiers of Christ face combat whether they are persecuted for their faith or not. Every soldier of Christ is a target of spiritual warfare, whether we face human opponents or not. As Paul reminded the church in Ephesians 6, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Answer 127 of the Heidelberg Catechism warns us, by ourselves we are too weak to hold our own even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. Satan, the sin-filled world, and our own sinful nature are the spiritual enemies that we have to battle against every moment of every day in this present world. Now, as we talk about spiritual enemies, several members of our church have seen combat against human enemies. Dirk Bottenberg de Young, the father of Helen Evenhouse, and Dave and John Bottenberg saw combat in Europe and on the Atlantic during World War II. He was a merchant sailor for the Netherlands from 1940 to 1945 during World War II. He participated in the evacuation of British and French soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk in May of 1940 as German forces came and trapped them in on the beaches. Dirk's ship, the steamer Mazdam, was anchored at Liverpool, England in April and May of 1941 where he witnessed Prime Minister Churchill giving an encouraging speech at the Liverpool docks that had just recently been bombed by the German Luftwaffe. Dirk and the rest of the crew on his ship endured German blitz bombing of Liverpool and its docks in May of 1941. Dirk describes the bombing in his journal written at that time which son Dave shared with me. And Dirk said this in his journal, at night, new air raids startle us again, which surpass all former attacks in severity. Shortly after 10 o'clock, hundreds of planes fly over and start bombing their destructive loads. Start dropping their destructive loads. A true rain of bombs starts, which continues for five hours. The devastation is indescribable. Incessantly, all sorts of bombs fall down, fire bombs, brissant bombs, and time bombs. Everything is put on fire with flames around us. Hundreds of treasured lives are lost, and others are light or heavily wounded. Houses, churches, schools, hospitals, large and small buildings, it all becomes a ruin. This isn't just a word more than awful. The devastation is so immense and it results even larger. 
Women and children are hit. Others scream with fright. It could be called a certain hell. A burst of demonic forces which people, people shaped after God's image, are carrying out. David once prayed, Lord, don't let me fall in people's hands, but in your hands, for your mercy is multiple. When one experiences such a dreadful occurrence, then all doubts regarding these words disappear in one stroke. And we continue to pretend that people are not so bad and accuse God of everything. May the Lord give me and others the insight more and more to understand his voice calling me in these serious times. This is my wish and prayer. Unquote. Dirk and other crew members had to remove incendiary bombs from their ship deck, one of which landed 10 feet from him. Later, he was thrown against his cabin wall when a nearby ship's load of bombs and shells exploded. Seven weeks later, on June 26, 1941, Dirk's ship was torpedoed by a German U-boat and sank to the bottom of the North Atlantic. Thankfully, Dirk and the rest of the surviving crew of the Mazdam were rescued by a couple of nearby ships. He was taken to Iceland and later went back to England where he signed on another ship. After the United States entered the war, he sailed on Holland American liners that were converted to troop ships. Later, Dirk was awarded the War Remembrance Cross from the Netherlands for his service in 1955. So that's one example. Another example is Pastor Henry Van Wyk who experienced combat as a Marine against the Japanese in the Pacific during World War II. In the heat of combat on the islands of Saipan and Tinian, where he witnessed war buddies of his dying all around him, he promised the Lord that if God would spare his life, he would become a pastor. Well, as you know, the Lord did spare his life. And he obeyed the Lord's call to ministry, where he pastored five churches in Minnesota, Chicago, and West Michigan before he retired after 32 years of ministry. And Pastor Henry, as you know, served as pastor of visitation for 20 years here at 12th Avenue Church in his retirement, and he passed into glory a year later, and I was so blessed to be able to serve with him for the first year of my ministry here. Well, like Dirk and Pastor Henry and Others in the military tied to our church who have seen combat, soldiers of Christ will see combat too, which comes from our spiritual enemies. That's why the armor of God described in Ephesians 6 is so important. Armor that we need to wear and that we need to live out every day of our lives. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. This armor protects us from the enemy's attacks. The sword of the Spirit and prayer serve as offensive weapons that repel and disperse Satan's forces. That's why we prayed for God's armor to be on us earlier in the service this morning. I put each piece of God's armor on in prayer every morning as part of my devotions, and I encourage you all to do the same. Next, Paul shares some word pictures with Timothy that reinforce the importance of being strong in the Lord and faithful to Him in verses 4 through 7. Timothy and we are to act as soldiers, as verse 4 says. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. A good soldier focuses on their duty and pleasing their commanding officer. Those of you who are veterans know what it means to carry out the orders of your commanding officer as part of your military duty. Let me just share a few more examples. John Batts was a military commander on Canton Island in the Pacific during World War II. Louis Zamperini, the bomber whose story is told in the novel Unbroken and the two films based on that book, 
had an emergency landing on that island. While Paul, well, John was serving there shortly before Louis had his 46-day rafting experience in the Pacific. Bill Achterhoff served in the Navy, and he enlisted in the Navy right after World War II, and he served for one and a half years. He spent most of his service on the battleship Missouri, the famous battleship on whose deck Japanese leaders signed surrender papers before American General Douglas MacArthur in Tokyo Harbor. He served as the weatherman on board and loved his time of service, and Phyllis let me know that, that he just loved being there. John Zydema served in the Navy after World War II, and he worked with blimps. Larry Vredevo served as a member of the Coast Guard on a ship in the Pacific, and he was in charge of the crew's laundry, and he also served after World War II. As you just saw a glimpse of, uh, Pastor Jim Evenhouse served in the Army Reserve as a chaplain. And John Bottenberg served in the Air Force as a loadmaster on a C-141 cargo plane during the Vietnam War. Once when John's plane was attempting to land at a base in Laos during a CIA operation, the plane's wing hit a light stand in the runway. Since the wing was loaded with fuel, the plane was set on fire immediately and was totally destroyed. Thankfully, John and the other crew members were spared, but they had to be stranded overseas for 30 days, which included a major investigation and debriefing. And besides those veterans and all the rest of you that have served as veterans, we're also grateful for our sons and our grandsons who are now serving in the military and for those that have served before. Jason Starr is an Air Force pilot. Arla's son. Josh Camiller, the son of Steve and Peggy, is an Army Ranger who will soon be training, Lord willing, to be a Green Beret. John Bottoma, son of Pete and Karen, is a Marine. Mike Decker, the son of Joel and Carol, is a staff sergeant in the Air Force. Ryan Van Vell, son of Jim and Laura, is a missile commander in the Air Force. Marshall Bauman, the grandson of Kathy Bauman, is a Navy SEAL. Jonathan DeVries, the grandson of Joy and Marv Pullman, is a Marine now stationed at Camp Pendleton in Florida. It's kind of a funny picture of them, but this is during their wedding, I believe. He was stationed in Japan for several years where he met his wife, Naoko, and had, they had two children together. When he left Japan, he was a warrant officer, level three, in charge of air, the Air Force Ordnance on military aircraft in the Pacific Rim. And, he was also the commander of a task force that could be deployed for relief and, and military efforts. Travis Vandenberg, the grandson of Dave and Sharon Ellenboss, is in the Army and stationed in Italy. And finally, Stuart Vanderkoy is a tank commander, a tank platoon leader in the Army. We're grateful for all of them. And the fact is we are all soldiers of Christ who can resist the forces of evil by seeking to please Jesus Christ, our commanding officer. As Paul declares in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, we make it our goal to please him. If we keep that desire front and center, it helps us to resist temptation and sin. Timothy and we are to act like a competitive athlete also, as verse 5 emphasizes. Similarly, if anyone competes in an, as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. A relay runner is disqualified if she drops her baton. A football team's touchdown reception will be called back if their team is called for a holding penalty. 
basketball players' basket won't count if they're called for an offensive charge. In the same way, we can only achieve victory in the Christian life if we follow the Lord's rules and walk in obedience to Him. And Timothy and we are to look forward to our spiritual harvest like a diligent farmer as we read in verse 6. The hardworking farmer should be first to receive a share of the crops. Like an industrious farmer does everything he can with his planting and field maintenance to produce an abundant crop, we need to do all we can to sow righteous deeds and to maintain a holy life so that a, a great spiritual harvest can finally come. Paul urges Timothy to take his duty of strength and faithfulness as Christ's soldier seriously as we hear him say to him in verse 7, Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And the second truth that we find in this scripture this morning is that we serve as Christ's soldiers looking forward to Christ's victorious reign. Today, America joins her allies of England, France, and Italy in celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of the Great War against the central powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Our past military personnel have looked forward to the end of the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the Gulf War, and the Iraq War. Our present military personnel look forward to the end of the war on terror and the end of the threat of opponents like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. As Paul and Timothy faced persecution from Roman authorities, they look forward to the day when the Christian faith would triumph in the Roman Empire. But they and every soldier after them, look, including us, look forward to the day when our commander, King Jesus, finally defeats Satan, sin, the evil world system that stands against God, and finally the last enemy, death itself. Every soldier in Christ's army looks forward to the day when Jesus returns to visibly reign over a renewed creation, a kingdom where the prophet Isaiah predicts. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. As Timothy braces himself against pagan Roman authorities outside the church and false teachers within the church, Paul urges his protege to have this outlook in verses 8 through 10. Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I like how the message paraphrases these verses. Fix this picture firmly in your mind. Jesus, descended from the line of David, raised from the dead. It's what you've heard from me all along. It's what I'm sitting in jail for right now. But God's word is not in jail. That's why I stick it out here, so that everyone God calls will get in on the salvation of Christ in all its glory. Paul is focused on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from the start, the good news that the God-man Jesus has come to set us free from sin and the forces of evil. Jesus as a human being is a royal descendant of King David. And Jesus proved his divinity by rising from the dead. Paul is willing to endure suffering for this good news so that everyone can know it and be saved from their sins by it. Even though Paul is in chains like a criminal, God's word is not chained. That word will continue to spread everywhere until everyone hears the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And Paul finally quotes the lyrics of what is probably an early Christian hymn that Paul, Timothy, and the early church would have been very familiar with in verses 11 and 12. 11 to 13, where Paul says, Here's a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. It's a song of encouragement that emphasizes that if we give up everything, including our lives for Christ, we will live with him. If we endure through persecution and other suffering that we have to go through, we will reign with Christ. Now, if we disown Christ, he will disown us. If we're faithless, Christ will remain faithful because he has to remain true to himself. Jesus can't be anything less than faithful to himself or to us. While we often struggle with faithfulness to Christ, Christ is always faithful to us. Dave Bottenberg wrote an article about his father Dirk's experience during the May Blitz in Liverpool, England, which he shared with me as I prepared this message. Dirk wrote more than 800 words in his journal to record that unforgettable night. Dirk openly confesses there his inability to trust God and he describes his feelings of fear over the events of that week. Dirk comforted his heart by quoting the words of the prophet Isaiah that are deeply fitting for the events of that night of the May Blitz, the worst night of the bombing. And these words of Isaiah 43, verse 2, where the Lord says, When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow over you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Dirk, despite his fear, put his trust in him. And he was faithful to him. One of the, faith, one of the favorite scriptures of military in the Gulf War of American soldiers in the Gulf War was Psalm 91, which we read as our call to worship this morning. Like Isaiah 43, this psalm promises God's faithful protection for those who love him. Psalm 91 begins with these words. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. As soldiers of Christ, we too must rely on the Lord's faithfulness to protect us and to equip us to be faithful to him with his armor and his weapons. I'm grateful that our children and grandchildren who serve our country in the military, are also protected by the hand of our faithful commander and Lord. I'm grateful that he will also protect us and enable us to stand firm against the attacks of our spiritual enemies. Brothers and sisters, blessed is Christ's soldiers. Are we seeking to please our commander with our confident faithfulness? May that so be for all of us. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that Christ is our commander and that he has called us to be his soldiers as we put our trust in him. We thank you, Lord, that just as Paul encouraged Timothy, we are encouraged now by him to 
serve as your soldiers, to seek to please you, our commanding officer. As we stand firm, equipped with the armor of God and the weapons of prayer in your word, to hold fast against the forces of evil in our world, Satan and sin, and the sin that battles within us as well. Father, help us to stand firm, to be faithful, and to courageously follow you as you lead us. And Lord, we look forward to the day when you will return, just as generals have done of old, bringing victory over evil, victory to your armies, and victory to your people as every last force of evil and death itself will finally be conquered forever. And Lord, we look forward to that day and live for it. In Jesus' name, amen.